Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Bold uh, Pipeline Fighters Hub Briefing on landowner rights and CO2 pipelines. My name's Jane Klebb. I founded the group Bold Nebraska, and we have, in recent years, broadened the umbrella to work in other states and work in partnership in states to fight pipelines and to protect property rights and to make sure that our land and water is protected. So today we will be hearing from a couple experts, uh, one on the risks of carbon pipelines and one on the landowner legal rights. But we wanna start today's briefing with a landowner, Jeannie Crumley, who was one of the biggest voices and leaders on the fight against the Keystone XL pipeline. She's gonna share with us some of her experiences. Before I kick it to her, let me uh, kick it to Mark to give some logistics. Apologies, I was just jumping right into the deep end, Mark. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Mark Hefflinger. Uh, you see him pronouns. I am the communications and digital director for the Bold Alliance, which includes Bold Nebraska and the Pipeline Fighters Hub. I've been with him since 2013. Uh, broadcasting to you live today from Denver, also Cheyenne Arapaho Ute territories. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things for today's session. We are going to have a Q&A where you can ask questions of uh, attorneys and the other folks on the call. Uh, if you are calling by, if you're joining by phone, please uh, do the uh, email and you can email mark, M-A-R-K at boldnebraska.org uh, if you wanna ask a question. If you're with us on the Zoom, at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. Um, you can uh, type your questions in at any time during the webinar, and we'll try and get to them uh, either with a text reply or we will call out your question in the webinar. You are welcome to remain anonymous with your questions or identify yourself however you'd like with your name and where you're from. Um, just a heads up, there may be some members of the media on this. Uh, it's uh, open to the public and uh, you know, we do want to make sure that the media is covering our side of the message. So uh, just keep that in mind as we move along. And uh, thanks again. Back to Jane. Thanks, Mark. In addition to the media and fellow landowners and climate folks that are concerned with these pipelines, uh, there might even be people from Summit Carbon Pipeline or Navigator Pipeline on as well. So hello to you if you're on. Uh, and we're happy that you're here and hearing our side of the story. And just know that when we get to the legal portion, Brian uh, and all of us won't be giving out our entire strategy, obviously, on this conference call because of that reason. Uh, but we will be giving a really good overview of your property rights. So we're going to kick in first with Jeannie Crumley, who lives in the Sand Hills of Nebraska, uh, one of our fierce pipeline fighters. She's going to talk a little bit about her experience on Keystone XL and how one of the biggest reasons why we believe we won the pipeline fight was we brought together this unlikely alliance and the landowners stuck together throughout the whole process. So I'm gonna turn this over to Jeannie. Thank you, Jane, you're right. It was landowners, um, but a, a much broader team than that. I was involved in the Keystone fight starting as early as 2013. And I think some of you will remember the uh, State Department hearing in Grand Island and standing in the blizzard. And I'll return to that at the very end. Um, but the, my impression is that landowners often are uninformed when this all begins. We're uninformed in terms of the science, we're uninformed in terms of the politics, which is huge, and we're uninformed in terms of the economics. So we come into it really ill-equipped for this kind of fight. And because of that, my experience with KXL says that you need a three-pronged response. And that response is activism, which, thank you, Jane, Jane brought bold early on from the very beginning uh, to, to unify us and create a voice, a very clever and creative one, I have to say, that garnered public attention and really turned the tide in terms of state opinion. Uh, we couldn't have been successful with that without the likes of Mr. Jordy here, uh, the legal muscle of our fight, who, who educated us on eminent domain, eminent domain law, and was a fierce, fierce fighter for us in the legal realm. And finally, with those two guides or um, props, we had a unified local community that stayed strong with the support of Bold and the Domino Law Firm. So at the local level, key factors are sharing information, presenting a common voice and educating your community that might be personal neighbor to neighbor, but also letters to the editor and consistent representation at local um, 
zoning meetings, supervisors meetings, look our neighbors that are that are representing us in the eye and, and make them know they're accountable to us. Inform them where they don't inform because they're getting a lot of money and a lot of information from the opposing side. And so we have to counter that. Uh, as we educate ourselves, know that the pipeline company is not your source of, of information. They are not your friends. They are not going to educate you. You have to do the education on your own. And often that means countering the information that you're getting from this friend that's here just to help your community. They're not. They're there to um, line their pocket. And we are the ones that are supposed to be um, providing that access for them. With that said, the very first thing I think that Brian taught us is that you never sign anything. You never sign anything without legal counsel, something as, as harmless as it, as just walk on my land to survey it, baloney. We do not sign that. In fact, better not to even have the discussion, send it through your legal counsel because they're the ones that then can give your voice um, and, and it takes the confusion out of our mind because we don't know a lot of the things that legal counsel has to survey what's uh, being offered. And it was a comfort to us to know that Brian was there um, to answer our questions and also represent us. Um, with all, all that said, in that local community, form a bond, really become accountable to one another, inform one another, make phone calls, do social events so those bonds are deep and rich and fun even, because then when the hard things come in, that that community is formed and you can stand strong. With that, I'm going to relate back to that Grand Island, standing out in the blizzard, 7 a.m. to 11 a.m., believe it or not standing in a blizzard waiting to go into a meeting so we would have the right to testify. And Jane Club and Bold Nebraska was there with hot coffee and hot chocolate and people to hold that line. And because of that, we were able to stay, stay strong. And I think that's a metaphor. We, when you're encountering a fight like this, it's like you're in the blizzard and you take those resources that legal counsel, those um, Jane and the activists behind you and let them hold your place in line. If you're feeling a little bit frail, if you need that coffee, if you need that hot chocolate, um, rely on those resources, stay strong as a community, and hopefully your outcome will be as wonderful as our one. So I thank you, Brian Jordy. That's thank it. You, Jeannie. Thank you, Jeannie. Uh, the letters, I, I would say, I know Jeannie mentioned it uh, in her comments, but letters to the editor, and Jeannie wrote many of them in, in longer opinion pieces in our papers, were really critical as one of those tools to use your voice as a landowner or as a fellow advocate if you're standing shoulder to shoulder with landowners. So I strongly encourage you to do that. And there's no question that the events that we did on Keystone that we've done at on down on Bihalia pipeline or that the Atlantic Coast pipeline folks did or the Jordan Cove pipeline, all of those pipelines have been stopped because of the work that landowners, tribes, climate advocates and legal advocates all did together. And that's what we're going to bring to this carbon pipeline fight as well. We uh, didn't know anything about uh, tar sands, just like we didn't know anything about carbon pipelines. And so that brings in our new speaker. I remember getting an email about a month and a half, two months ago from a landowner, Bev, who was on the Keystone XL route, asking if I had heard of these carbon pipelines. And I felt like it was deja vu from getting emails from farmers and ranchers early on in Keystone. We started to Google, Mark did research, and other folks did research, and we came across Carol who is definitely the leading expert on carbon pipelines, the risks of carbon pipelines, how this is really just a big scam uh, that big oil companies are pushing in order to take more federal uh, taxpayer subsidies. So with that, Carol, I'll pass the mic to you. Um, can you enable screen, screen sharing? Sorry, Carol, you're not able to share yours? Sorry. Yeah, I'm trying to share and it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Sorry, I will fix that real quick. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe maybe while we're waiting, um, uh, thanks so much, th thanks so much, Jane, and, and thank you all for, for having me. Um, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to share this with you. If I, if I, hopefully I can share, share the PowerPoint presentation, but if I can't, I'll, I'll just 
um, walk you through the major issue. I'm working on it here. Oh, here we go. All panelists. Perfect. It, you got it? Got it. Um, all right. And Y'all should now be seeing my entire screen. Is that right? It looks great. Yep, we see it. OK, perfect. Um, if you remember nothing else from the next 10 minutes, I would like you to remember and really think about the video that I'm about to play for you. This video shows a rupture of a buried, dense phase carbon dioxide pipeline. The experiment was conducted in the safe environment of the DMVGL spade out of testing and research center to assess the consequences of such ruptures in terms of mass outflow, greater formation, and dense gas dispersion. The viewer should note that the extent of the visible plume does not necessarily represent the extent of the dense gas hazard. So I want you to remember a few things about that video. That was a test of a pipeline rupture in a controlled facility far away from human habitation of a relatively small CO2 pipeline safely buried beneath the ground. Um, and that's really important because the next pipeline rupture that you experience is unlikely to be in a secure testing facility far away from human habitation. And that is just one reason why we see widespread and rising opposition to carbon capture and storage in CCUS across the US and around the world, including from the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, from the 1500 organizations of Climate Action Network International, 200 groups across the Gulf South who are dealing with CCS and petrochemicals, the Indigenous Environment Network, um, and literally hundreds of organizations across the United States and around the world. Why the opposition to CCS? Well, let's start with the basic fact that CCS is fundamentally unnecessary to address, to address the climate crisis. CCS has for decades now been a cure in search of a disease. It was the thing that was first going to save coal, then it was going to save natural gas, and now we see, see it being argued as a way to address industrial emissions. All of those arguments fall apart on examination. Nowhere is that clearer than in the case of CCS and energy. Renewable energy is now the cheapest source of new bulk electricity um, across the Midwest, across the majority of the United States, and indeed for more than two thirds of the world's people. In 2021, the US Energy Information Agency estimated that 80% of new electric generating capacity in the United States would be renewables, it would be solar, it would be wind, it would be battery. The case for the case for fossil fuel powered electricity is falling apart rapidly. And what's remarkable is we're seeing that the, the case for fossil fuels is falling apart even with existing plants. Um, renewable energy is becoming so cheap, so effective that it is actually cheaper in many cases than continuing to operate existing coal plants 
or in some cases, operating existing natural gas fired power plants. And one consequence of that, as I alluded, is that the proponents of CCS are increasingly relying on the idea that what we need CCS for is to capture hard to reach industrial sector emissions, things like plastics and cement and steel and petrochemicals production and ethanol. In 2020, a research team that included scientists from Chevron, a major, major corporate proponent of CCS, did an analysis of all industrial facilities identified by the US EPA um, and looked at their emissions and looked at the viability of CCS for those facilities. Now, industrial processes are a major source of US emissions. They accounted for 30% of emissions in 2019. But when that team, including Chevron, looked at 1,600 industrial facilities in the US, what they found is only 656 of those facilities were even potentially viable for carbon capture and storage. And of those, less than half were within 200 miles of a feasible injection site. In total, they found only 123 industrial facilities, about 8% of all industrial facilities in the US, had any potential to capture CO2 cost effectively, even if you were using the CO2 for enhanced oil recovery, and even if it had full access to federal subsidies. Uh, remarkably, even within those facilities, there was a lot of CO2 that couldn't be captured. And as a result, their, their analysis found that CO2, carbon capture and storage was only viable for about 3.5% of all US industrial sector emissions, and even those emissions get, those reductions get erased if you're using the captured CO2 just to produce more oil. Um, I mentioned this because when, you know, many of the figures that they looked at, they looked at refining and found that many of the emissions in refining weren't viable for CO2 for carbon capture. They looked at chemical production and found the same thing. One of the reasons y'all are grappling with the projects you're grappling with in the in, in, in the upper Midwest is because ethanol production is one of the few places where you get a pure enough CO2 stream that they can essentially justify the use of this technology to capture it. But it's really important to recognize that capturing the CO2 is only the first part of the process. Um, you then have to move that CO2 to some place where you're gonna store it. At, at present, there are only about 5,000 miles of CO2 pipelines in the entire U.S. And those 5,000 miles are overwhelmingly concentrated in remote oil and gas fields of Western Texas. Proponents of carbon capture and storage are looking to expand that pipeline network to anything from 25,000 to 65,000 miles or more of new pipelines in the next few decades. And that's gonna move those pipelines out of oil fields, out of remote areas, and into communities, into farmlands, into inhabited areas. And we're seeing that with a growing focus on a handful of corridors where you can find both significant sources of CO2 emissions and access to places where you can store that CO2. And unfortunately, the, the upper Midwest and the Great Plains have been identified as one of those corridors. And this is the reason you're facing not one, but two major proposals for CO2 pipelines. I do wanna note that the, that, the, that the risks of these pipelines are not limited to the eight states that are facing the Summit Pipeline and, and, the, and the Navigator Heartland Pipeline. Um, in fact, we're seeing emerging risks around CO2 pipelines in a number of places. And it is really critically important to note that there are risks and they are potentially significant. Despite the fact that proponents of these technologies sort of highlight the fact that CO2 is what makes your fizzy water fizzy and therefore it's inherently safe, the, the truth is when you condense CO2 to the pressures and the temperatures that are needed to transport it over large distances, becomes a fundamentally different and a fundamentally more hazardous substance. It is operating at pressures far higher than are generally indicated for natural gas distribution pipelines. And CO2, when it's compressed, becomes corrosive. 
Um, and if there are any contaminants, whether it's hydrogen sulfide or even modest amounts of water, it becomes even more corrosive. And this can lead to leaks, to fractures, and to running ruptures of pipelines. We saw the implications of that in Satarsha, Mississippi in February of 2020, um, when a, a rupture of a relatively modest sized pipeline led to more than 300 people being evacuated and dozens of people sent to hospitals and what first responders described as people wandering around frothing at the mouth and acting like zombies. This is really important because it's important to recognize that CO2 um, is an asphyxiant and, a to and an intoxicant. What that means is at high levels of exposure, uh, at 15%, CO2 can put you into a coma. At 30%, it is lethal. And even at smaller concentrations, it can intoxicate you so you can't think clearly enough to get to safety. And that's really important because, again, the next time you see a CO2 pipeline rupture, it's unlikely to be in an industrial testing facility. But those aren't the only risks with CO2 pipelines and with carbon capture and storage. Because once you get to the end of that pipeline, you have to inject the CO2 somewhere. And there are basically two options. One, and the option that most CO2 is used for is enhanced oil recovery. That is to say most captured carbon is simply used to produce more oil, which is then burned, which releases more carbon. The other option is that the CO2 can be injected into saline aquifers. The challenge with saline aquifers is that if the pressure in those aquifers isn't carefully controlled, it can produce earthquakes, just like fracking. It can lead to contamination of groundwater, either from the CO2 itself or from the brine that the CO2 displaces, and it can lead to fractures and the release of the CO2, which could create both toxic risks and risks for the climate. So how do you maintain pressure in those aquifers? Well, the more CO2 you inject, the more produced water you generally have to remove. Um, and folks who have been fighting fracking for a long time will recognize the risks of produced water. Produced water brings up not only hazardous substances and toxins. In many areas, produced water also mobilizes natural background radiation, concentrates it, and brings it to the surface. Um, and this is why people who have fought against fracking in North Dakota, in other parts of the Great Plains, have really also simultaneously had to deal with rising risks from produced waters, including you know, what happens to those radioactive toxins. And so before I end, I'll just note that these are questions you need to be asking, not only the companies, but regulators. How safe are those pipelines? How are you ensuring the pipelines are safe? What are the risks if we're exposed? How are you controlling those risks? Um, what are the fundamental reasons for this project as a whole? And what are you gonna be doing with these massive streams of produced hazardous, potentially radioactive water that come out of the ground. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Jane. Thanks, Carol. And Carol's gonna stay on because we will take questions at the end. Um, and a lot of things that Carol was bringing up and even other things that we've brought up on some of the other calls that we've done about decommissioning, about setbacks, about the type of steel that is being used, about the corrosive nature, about how risky and how our federal government already says we shouldn't be converting fracked gas or oil pipelines to carbon pipelines. There are so many other pieces of this puzzle as we continue to do education seminars, we'll be addressing more of those questions as well. Next up is Brian Jordy. He is a law firm with Domino Law Group. Uh, he was the lead attorney, the lead <laughs> Eagle Eagle, as I say, for the Keystone XL fight. Uh, both representing the landowner's property rights uh, against eminent domain, but also in regulatory bodies as well, as well as at the state legislature trying to get better laws in place. So with that, I'll pass the mic over to Brian Jordy. Thank you, Jane, and thank you everyone for joining us today and your interest in this uh, important issue that unfortunately is affecting most, if not all of you. Um, from my perspective, there's so many different areas we could cover, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. But when we break down the 
legal baskets or the legal, legal paths that you might be confronted with on such a project, the very first is, what are your rights today? Day one, when confronted with someone knocking on your door, sending you a letter, um, certified wanting you to sign for it, trying to get you to do something that you may not want to do. So there's the bucket of what can you help me with right now? What are my immediate rights? Then there's, if there's to be a fight, what does that look like? And then if the fight was to be lost, are there other avenues to protect my land, my interest, and my investment in my land, my residence, whatever might be affected? So I want to briefly touch on uh, each of those uh, to a high level overview. Right out of the gate, most likely you are receiving either certified letters or some type of a communication or maybe a very friendly person knocking on your door wanting to sit down at your kitchen table and talk to you about how wonderful this project is and won't you please just sign this piece of paper. Uh, and those conversations can go from friendly to quite pushy and, and oftentimes people are confused. Do I have to talk to this person? Do I have to sign this? Do I have a time frame or is there a deadline? And each state is different in terms of, for instance, can a surveyor or an agent of the pipeline company come onto your property without you authorizing that? Uh, in Nebraska, that's not allowed. In Iowa, unfortunately, if certain hurdles are met, a uh, certified letter 10 days before and other types of things to the landowner or the person on the property, they can come onto your property. And so then the question is, well, what can I do once someone's on my property? Well, again, it's your land, it's your home. You can follow them around. You can watch what they're doing. You can police their activities and make sure they're only within a certain area and not willy nilly walking all over your property. Uh, you can ask them to produce a, a map of the proposed route, give you more detail. You can take photos of them, video them, monitor them for any types of property damage. Um, we, uh, you can report them to the sheriff or local authority if you believe they have damaged something or done something that they're not supposed to do. Uh, so, so right out of the gate, essentially, you have to be brave, okay? You don't want this, and you could sit on your hands and, and talk about it and complain about it, or you can get noisy and be brave about protecting what you have financial um, and emotional interest in your home, your land, your property. So that's kind of the immediate thing, understanding that, A, you don't have to talk to anybody, right? If someone calls you out of the blue or a telemarketer, you do not have to sit there and talk to them. Um, and in Iowa, you have to let them on your land and other places you, you may not have to. So if that's kind of the first bucket of things, the, the second is, well, now if they've done the survey and they're coming with the um, easement or the lease or what they want me to sign, do I have to sign that or even respond? The answer is no. Until these projects have if they can get it, uh, and if that's even a path, the power of eminent domain, depending upon which state you're in, until they have that power that is either granted by existing laws or by a procedure through most likely a state utility board or public service commission or otherwise, they can't take your property, okay, for their intended use. And so the question is, why would you voluntarily sign over rights to for a project that you don't really understand you're sure there's risks that you don't fully appreciate you may not trust the people behind it oh by the way they've never done it before there might be some um investigating into the past of the people behind these companies that isn't exactly the most complimentary or encouraging uh, for a project of this magnitude uh, and you don't know the full effects of what you're signing uh, and that it potentially is forever, uh, and you don't know the first thing about how to negotiate payments, uh, whether it's fair or not. So why would you sign it? You know, that's the rhetorical question. Why would you voluntarily sign something that you didn't want and you don't understand? So don't feel the pressure to sign easements away. You have rights as landowners, property owners. You have rights to the surface rights, vegetation, improvement rights, air rights, anything you can do within a lawful context on, under, or above your property. 
And if you sign those rights away to a pipeline company, for instance, you have granted them the right to prevent you from doing certain things and then also granted them the right to do things that you maybe wouldn't want them to do. It's unlikely that any of you, the night before you first learned about this project, were thinking, gosh darn it, I wish I had a CO2 pipeline running underneath my house. And if you weren't thinking that, why are people so eager, in a sense, or so willing to sign it over? And it's usually because of intimidation. Uh, also, we're busy in our lives. People think, I can't stop this. It's going to come anyway. Who cares? Just sign it. I have no hope. And if you take anything away from this, this call, I hope you realize that there is a gigantic network forged over battles and experience over the last decade all across this country that is coming together in a very exciting way to unite, to provide the advocacy piece, the outreach piece, the organizational piece, the legal piece, uh, to put on the very best representation and presentation of your case and your evidence should that need to occur in your various states. And then therefore you even after the fact, if for whatever reason, it wouldn't be successful. So the takeaway really here is sign nothing, uh, as Jeannie had said, and uh, was beaten into the Nebraska landowners pretty much every time we saw them and realize this is yours, right? Why would you willingly give anything away? Um, and so the legal rights are not only to prevent them from doing certain things that we've discussed, holding out, because again, until they have full approvals, why would you give up something that you have now when you don't really understand what's going on? The more people that voluntarily sign, all the pipeline company does is say, well, look here, public, we already have X percent of people signed up. Therefore, inference being, the people that have it must be those just crazy tree-hugging people that don't care about progress and, and making money. Um, and, and so don't let don't let your fear uh, of standing up for yourself or, or, or inability to do that or fear of confrontation lead to becoming a statistic which you really hurt yourself and your neighbors in the future. So by all means, sign nothing at all. Um, the next part of the legal process is the pipeline companies most likely will be applying for route approvals, uh, eminent domain condemnation triggering rights. We are here to help all of us collectively organize and develop the testimony, the evidence, to put on the best narrative and message to be presented before the respective state boards so they can think long and hard about the critical question in these projects, which is, do they serve the public interest or do they serve public use? In order for your land to be taken under the Fifth Amendment, it has to be for a public use. Now that's been watered down into public purpose, public benefit, and there's different legal interpretations. But at a high level, is this project serving the public in some way? In other words, if one person or a private company is going to take land from another person who doesn't want to give it up to put a certain type of project across all of Iowa, Nebraska, and other states, that better serve the public as a whole. Imagine a public park. Okay, public parks for various reasons, we can see the benefits in having those in green spaces. Uh, say a public hospital owned by the county, that's a benefit to have in that community. It uh, keeps us safe, an option to go for when we're in need. But a privately owned carbon pipeline that is simply taking a product across your land to dump it in a 12 by 12 underground unknown cave essentially in North Dakota to just hopefully sit there and never hurt anything is in no way, in my opinion, uh, of a public benefit, a public purpose, or a public use. You are not putting your carbon on this pipeline and somehow getting paid for it as if you're a pipeline shipper. And so the, the, the question that this all comes back to is what at the end of the day is the public use? And we could go on and on but that's kind of where the legal effort will be framed in a technical legal sense. In the advocacy piece and everything leading up to that, um, all of the rhetorical questions and the unknowns need to get out there to the media and others and put it on the pipeline company to go back and answer the questions that they really can't answer. Um, anyway, I, I, I can feel myself wanting to go on for hours here, but I wanna keep it, keep it moving. So 
that's that's kind of the central piece of if there is actually a legal fight in a forum such as the for utility board we're ready willing and able with the team to help you put on the very best case obviously can't guarantee outcome but if you don't put on a good case uh, it's unlikely you have any chance and a good case is not only good arguments and compassionate stories that make sense it's volume the more of you that we have to say, here's one pipeline company and look at the 500 landowners and their family members and people from their community supporting them, the optics, the narrative, the story, at the end of the day, when you're trying to affect decision makers, you have to make them care, okay? If there's three people on a board making the decision, those are the only people that matter. Make them care. How do we get to them? And it's by holding strong, sticking together, et cetera. Then briefly, the last prong, which we hope we never get to, if the pipeline's approved, we've done everything we can, we've exhausted appeals, et cetera, the third prong is assisting landowners with negotiating easements or leases so that they are fair. You're protected from a liability standpoint, uh, which you're not, in my opinion, uh, if you sign their boilerplate uh, agreement, you're compensated fairly, and then if the negotiation fails, then there's a process whereby you can go through the court system and fight it out over the, the value that you should be paid for the inconvenience and the hassle to have this on your ground and affecting you. So those are the three prongs. We've done them all before in, in different states. We're ready, willing, able to help you. But the legal side is only as strong as the landowners, the property owners uh, like yourselves who care. So don't fold under the pressure, stand up for yourself, your family and your property, sign nothing and stay involved with this process so we can help you with more tips, tactics and strategies that we've uh, learned and are tried and true over many battles. So thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. We're gonna pause for a moment to take a few questions on the technical side of things that Carol presented or on some legal pieces that Brian presented. After we take some questions, we're then going to go to Jess and Beverly, one of the landowners in um, Iowa, and Jess is an organizer in Iowa, to give a little bit of an update of Iowa because they are further along in the regulatory review process. So we want to make sure that folks understand where Iowa's at. The other states, uh, it seems that the summit pipeline in particular have been really focused on Iowa because there's a very clear regulatory system for them to go through that's not as true in the other states. Uh, we will be doing in-person landowner meetings uh, in Nebraska. The Domino Law Group, Brian Jordy, will be representing landowners here in Nebraska. Um, and that may be true as well in other states. We're creating those legal structures as we speak. If you are a impacted landowner in any state, please make sure you fill out the form that Mark will put into the chat. Jess is absolutely the lead in Iowa. So if you've already completed uh, paperwork with Jess and you're in her landowner group, you don't have to fill that out. For all the other states, please do that because we're working with the grassroots groups on the ground to make sure that you as landowners are protected legally. So with that, we will open it up for any questions. Mark, I don't know if you're opening people's lines or are we just reading the questions in the Q&A? Um, we're doing a just a type in the Q&A. So folks, if you would like to ask a question, um, down at the bottom of your screen, uh, there's a bunch of the little icons. One of them says Q&A. Then you can just get in there, type your question. Uh, you're able to uh, change your name, be uh, anonymous if you'd like, or uh, just have your name show up in the chat. So with that, um, I think there's a couple of technical questions I'm going to assign to Carol, but I will just <clears throat> Actually, Carol, if you just want to try and read the question and then answer the first one there, I'll, I'll kick it off to you. Um, certainly, I mean, I, the very first question up is, you know, this process can't be used with electricity generation. It is a question, you know, and, and, you know, as opposed to industrial CCS. And I think the short answer is that, you know, the rationale for a long time was to, for deploying CCS was that it was going to save coal and allow us to keep using coal without emissions. But the problem is it just makes coal, which is already not competitive and very expensive, even more expensive, more high, high emitting. And so that argument for using CCS with coal has more or less evaporated. And we've seen in a very similar way, there just aren't, there just aren't many new natural gas power plants being built 
and retrofitting those plants with CCS technology makes them even more expensive and even less competitive. And so you're seeing very little argument that that's what should be done. And that's what's shifted the focus to industrial CCS. Um, there is one other question that, that came up and it, it concerned, you know, issues around the pipeline pressures and the pipe thicknesses. And there was a question around the, the regulatory standards involved. I don't wanna to get too far down in the weeds on the regulatory standards, but I will say on the issue of the pipeline specifications, I think this is a place where we need to be very attentive, very focused and very concerned. Because if you read the engineering, if you read the engineering journals on this stuff going back years, there was a real, acknowledgement that CO2 is fundamentally different from natural gas, fundamentally different from other, other even other hazardous liquids. Um, and I think one of the things that I saw the, that, that analysis split into two directions. One is we need to really take that on to, into account in designing specs and specifications for CO2. And then a smaller subset of, of engineers would say, but you know what, doing that is just going to be too expensive. So we have to find what is an acceptable level of safety. And I think that is a thing that we need to be really paying attention to because I've seen proponents of these pipelines sort of arguing that you can repurpose in existing infrastructure that was never designed for the physical properties and the unique risks of CO2. Um, and that, that includes building CO2 pipelines with pipelines de designed to an API standard that was never, never intended for CO2 use. So I think that's the thing to be really paying close attention to. I will say that on the pressure also, for example, the Keystone XL pipeline was at 1600 PSI, which was a very high pressure, uh, would then cause a lot of temperature, obviously for the soil, seed, et cetera, and be very dangerous if it bursts uh, in one part of the pipeline on the Keystone One. It was such high pressure that the oil, even though it's so thick, uh, goes into the air almost over six or eight feet. These pipelines, uh, the company itself is saying it could be anywhere for up to 2,200 PSI. Um, so these are high pressure uh, larger pipelines, anywhere from eight to 22 inch diameter. Um, so these are super risky as far as they're pressurized as well. Um, and so, Carol, when you asked, can Iowa get a law to not allow these folks onto the property? You know, Jess, maybe you want to talk about the Iowa Utility Board and how they actually have a fairly in depth uh, pipeline process, including uh, decommissioning and allowing people on property. Yes, yeah, so the pipeline process in Iowa starts out with just essentially a letter of intent, and then they hold informational hearings in every county that's impacted. And the surveyors and the land agents are not supposed to talk to any landowners until the hearing in their county is completed. And then after the hearings, um, the summit or navigator will start sending their surveyors out. Um, people can refuse a survey, but Iowa does have a law that with 10 day notice um, with via certified mail, they can come on to your land anyways. Land, it's not the case for land agents, people trying to get you to sign the easement, but for the surveyors who are just trying to look at your land, they can come on no matter what, but it doesn't mean you have to make it easy. Um, once the informational hearings are done, it has to be at least 30 days after the last hearing, the pipeline company can file for their full permit with the Iowa Utilities Board. Um, for summit, we expect that to happen probably in, in December or January. For navigator, maybe January or February. And then from there, it'll be like a, essentially a court proceeding where there's testimony and witnesses and experts and, and all that. And there'll be in-person cross-examination. And if we look at the Dakota Access Pipeline as the only identical pipeline that, of this process that we have in Iowa, it was about a year from when they filed for their full permit to when the Iowa Utilities Board made the final vote. Um, so we'll have, um, a, you know, we have a year, it's the marathon, not a sprint, but that's essentially the process. And we are looking into different legislative uh, um, efforts to strengthen eminent domain laws and, and stuff like that in Iowa. But with the surveyors, by the time we get to our legislative session, that process will likely already have been completed. Thanks, Jess. 
And there's a couple questions related to regulatory process state by state. Do we know the regulatory process? Do we know when eminent domain will kick in? Um, so the good news is, is we have hired Paul Blackburn, who's an expert on pipeline safety, pipeline regulatory systems. He is working right now on a state by state white paper that will explain to the landowners and to the public, as well as state legislators who we will start advocating for if there's not uh, current laws in place like in Nebraska. Um, so that paper will come out probably mid-December where it will show state by state what regulatory agencies currently have authority over carbon pipelines. When does eminent domain kick in? If it does, uh, you know, there's a lot of gray area which the carbon pipeline um, companies admit themselves is that the regulations are actually not made for carbon pipelines. They're mostly made for oil and gas in the states which is obviously great for advocates because we can make it clear that there's not safety measures in place. There's not a regulatory structure in place. These were many of the arguments that we had to use on Keystone in order to put some laws in place. So that is that paper is forthcoming. Um, and so the eminent domain law is actually, it's a very gray area in the vast majority of states because uh, carbon pipelines weren't really listed in many of the eminent domain laws, but that will be in a paper that Paul Blackburn's writing that uh, Brian Jordy and other attorneys like Scott Crosby will then be giving input on. Let's see. I'm just scrolling through, Mark. Is that what you want me to do and say those out loud? Um, sure. I see one from Carolyn asks, are there also dangers of man camps with these projects? Yeah, so I'll quickly answer that. I mean, the answer is yes. Uh, with any pipeline that is built, we know that out-of-state workers come into a state it ranges, despite what the pipeline company will say, I haven't heard the claim of what Summit is saying, I'm sure Jess knows. Um, usually they make some outlandish comment about how many jobs their pipeline's gonna bring. It usually ranges from 10,000 to 30,000, 40,000, 50,000. I mean, it gets really crazy because they use these Chamber of Commerce calculators to um, do kind of spin off jobs and they include that when they're talking to the public. But we have seen many pipelines built over the years, so we actually know. Uh, it essentially takes about 1,000 to 1,500 pipeline workers, as well as kind of the supplement workers who help with cleaning up and, and garbage and other things around the pipeline. That usually means they do either man camps or they do kind of trailer parks that they uh, contract out from different counties or hotels, depending on how close the pipeline route is to a city that has hotel capacity. So it ranges. Uh, so we don't know if man camps yet are being proposed for this, but if it follows the path of other pipelines, we know that there'll be about 1,000 to 1,500 direct jobs um, as it goes state by state, and that they probably will be using man camps or some type of trailer park. And I do um, want to say in case there's any union brothers or sisters on the line, and so that's clear, you know, our fight is not with union workers. Um, so the pipeline companies and big oil always tried to divide us and create this wedge between union workers and landowners, climate advocates and tribes. We're not interested in that fight. We want people to have good paying jobs. We don't want jobs that are threatening our livelihoods and threatening farmers and ranchers and landowners and tribal land. So our fight is not with the unions, our fight is with the pipeline. Thanks. I was just going to mention that some folks have asked about uh, getting a copy of Carol's PowerPoint or a video recording of this entire program. And I just want to let folks know that if you sign up by email, you will be receiving an email for the next day or two with both of those. So uh, be on the lookout. Thanks. Um, we also have a couple little bit more specific questions. Um, looks like landowner type things. Dave asks, if the proposed line comes less than a half mile of my house, but on neighbor's land, is there anything legally I can do? So yeah, I did. So yeah. So the the answer there, I mean, in terms of legally, yes, it's legally you can get involved in supporting all the efforts. You can file um, objections with, say, the utility board or others. Uh, you you don't actually directly have standing, so to speak, to take a legal action in your own name in most jurisdictions because technically the courts would find that you aren't directly affected. Um, but it's kind of like in Keystone, if, if 
you are a neighbor, get noisy, get active, uh, get out there and voice your opinions and, and concerns. So that's the best answer. Just get involved, stay involved. Unlike with wind, where they have good neighbor agreements. So if a wind turbine, wind farm is going on your neighbor's property, wind companies uh, nowadays, because a lot of advocacy work done by landowners and climate groups, uh, you also get a easement contract. That's not true when pipelines are built. It's, the, it's only the landowner in the route, but that doesn't mean exactly what Brian said, that you shouldn't be engaged and fight because at any moment they could reroute it and it could then be on your property. Great, and I see one more question. Looks like it's about surveying from Brenda. If we gate the properties, are they allowed to come through closed gates? Yep, good question. So just because you put up a physical barrier that won't affect their right to enter if you are in a state where the certain companies, like I said, if they send the 10 day certified letter in advance in Iowa, then the surveyors can enter, whether or not you're standing out there with a the shotgun or have a giant fence or a moat and alligators, whatever it is, they, they are going to be able to get on the property. So that's where it gets back to Jane's point of compiling the multi-state survey. And so we have a list of exactly who has what rights where. Um, in Nebraska, yes, you can lock it because even if you didn't have a lock, they couldn't get on. I would still encourage you to put no trespassing signs on and those type of things. Uh, even if you're in Iowa, just to send the message doesn't hurt. Um, but again, that goes back to a state by state uh, laws uh, that um, are different, unfortunately. Thanks, Brian. Oh, Jeannie, did you have something? I'll just add that as a point of levity. We didn't have gates, but we had uh, people that had legal permission to be on our ground. It was long past irrigation system, but to accommodate them, my husband turned on the irrigation system and they had to do their work under that. So there are ways that are just a little more clever. That's really good. I know in Australia, there's a whole movement of landowners where they say lock the gate. That's the kind of overall umbrella that they've created for themselves because they do make it as difficult as possible. Uh, because they don't want these projects on their property. Um, I will now pass this over to Jess. Uh, she is a kick-ass organizer in Iowa who has organized and focused on the landowners that are in the proposed route, as well as bringing these unlikely alliances together, which we know is critical in order to stop these projects. And I'll pass it to her so she can give an update on where Iowa is since they are furthest along on the process right now. Thank you so much, Jane, and thank you, Mark, and thank you, Bold Nebraska and Bold Alliance for kind of bringing people together, because um, the more I'm learning about this, like we truly are stronger together. And so I'm glad that multiple states are going to be working together on this. So in Iowa, um, we found out about this back in June and in early September or late September is when they started holding these informational hearings. And we immediately realized that one of the most important things we have to do first is to talk to as many landowners as possible to not sign those agreements. Because once you sign, you, you can't do anything um, to stop it at that point. So we've been really focused on that and trying to figure out different ways to identify who's impacted. We have been monitoring the Iowa Utilities Board objections to identify landowners. We've put out petitions. We have held webinars, um, different things, um, blog posts and stuff on our, on our website. So hopefully when, you know, when someone finds out and gets a letter that they go online and Google carbon pipelines and hopefully they encounter us. So like, I really recommend putting material out there that people can uh, make it easier to find you. And then we've been building a list. We're tracking who they are, where the land is, how to get a hold of them, little notes about how we met them. Um, and so we have in Iowa over 300 landowners who are mad as hell and they are not gonna let this on their land. So in Iowa, it's going really well. Um, and those are mostly people impacted by Summit because the Navigator Pipeline people just got letters in the past week or so. So I think that list is likely gonna double. Um, so, you know, go Nebraska, we need you, you need us, get your landowners organized. Um, but that has been really helpful. We have a small group of landowners that meets weekly um, to kind of craft plans and strategy. We've done a couple things. Um, to help, like, to help slow down the process. So Summit, um, right off the bat, has immediately requested all the counties in Iowa hire a certain inspection company. In Iowa, every county is required to hire an inspection company that oversees the actual construction, not anything else, just the actual construction of the pipeline. 
And we don't want them to hire the, the company recommended by Summit, um, the same company that inspected Dakota Access, and it was awful. Um, so we have landowners calling their supervisors. We've successfully got at least five counties that I'm tracking that have agreed not to hire ISG. Uh, we've also um, encountered, one of the things that we're struggling with is we know there are a lot more landowners out there that we haven't reached yet that probably feel alone and feel hopeless. And so we know Summit and Navigator have a list of landowners because they sent out those certified letters. And we want that list. We want to be able to talk to people and make sure they understand the reality of this before Summit intimidates and bullies them or Navigator intimidates and bullies them. And so we have a, an action right now to make that list public. We've had over 200 comments submitted to the Iowa Utilities Board. Um, a huge chunk of those are landowners make, to make the list public. And we forced a response from Summit. We've earned the support of the Office of Consumer Advocates with the Department of Justice in our request. Um, and so we're gonna continue to escalate. We're looking at all the different angles though. I think one of the most important things that we can remember is that, um, and, and what you guys have expressed so well on this call is that everyone comes to this fight with a different reason. And it might be landowner rights, it might be climate change, it might be water, it might be public money um, going to big corporations. Um, it doesn't matter what the reason is. It's important that we have to remember we can't fight each other. We have to look past the differences and remember what has united us. And what's united us is we're against these pipelines. We care for our land. We care for each other and we care for our communities. And if we can remember that, we can work together and we can stop these pipelines. And I have no doubt in my mind that we can and we will stop these pipelines because there's just an incredible energy that I'm seeing in Iowa and now I'm seeing in Nebraska and it sounds like that's spreading to the other states. Um, so I wanna just thank everybody who's been involved so far. Thank all the organizations and um, Brian for speaking with a group of over hundred landowners last night from Iowa. And yeah, so I think, you know, don't let anyone feel hopeless. This isn't a done deal. We will stop these pipelines. No one is alone. We have each other's backs and we'll do this. Amen, Jess, amen. Next, we're gonna hear from Bonnie, who's a landowner in Iowa to share some of her experiences. And I'll say that we've focused a lot on this call on landowners who could be in the proposed path of the pipelines, but we're also definitely working with landowners who might be on the side of the carbon sequestration where they wanna use a 12 mile by 12 mile uh, section of land and inject the carbon into uh, folks' property and utilize eminent domain for that. So that is also a piece of the organizing. So I don't want them to feel left out if they're on the call as well. So Bonnie, I'll turn the mic over to you. Oh, Bonnie, you're uh, still muted. Okay, there you go. Can you hear me? Okay, thank Got you. you. <laughs> I'm new to this Zoom business, but um, we own a farm in Crawford County, Iowa, near Denison. We're absentee landowners. I live up by uh, Oka, uh, Lake Okaboji. But we didn't know anything about this till we got a note from our mailman that we had let, certified letters to sign. And we had to go to the post office to get them. Uh, and we read these letters that they were going to Put a, they were going to capture carbon and put it in a pipe and send it to North Dakota. And it just sounded crazy. And then we learned that it was going to cost about $5 billion. And we thought we weren't too happy about that. Then we realized if we didn't agree, they were going to do it by eminent domain. And uh, you could tell our tempers were getting a little hot. And I knew nothing about it. So I started uh, Googling uh, CO2. And it took me to the Sierra Club website where I found the video on Sertatia, Mississippi. And I was just aghast at what I saw. And that's how I got involved in all this. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I, I'm part of the, as Jessica calls it, the leadership team on this um, organization. But uh, I just wanted to tell everybody, as everybody said, don't sign anything, but they're really going to try to get you to sign. They're going to do all kinds of uh, tricky and nefarious things. Uh, a few days after the county, our county meeting, we got our first phone call. My husband took it, and being the polite person that he is, he said, "Well, yeah, I'd like, I'll, I'll talk to you." But 
he was wise enough to say, not over the phone, you need to come to our house. And uh, I intercepted that and said, they're not coming to our house. <laughs> and uh, so they started calling and we just kept ignoring their calls. And they called for weeks wanting to make an appointment to sit down at our table and talk to us. And we just didn't think we had anything to say to them. So they gave up on that. Uh, and then the surveyor, the person wanting to set up the survey started calling and she's still calling and she's relentless. She calls at 7.15 in the morning. She calls at nine o'clock at night. She wants us to call back and talk to her about setting up a survey. And we know that if we don't agree, they have to send us the, the certified letter for 10 day um, notification. And we haven't received that yet. But the other thing I want to say is uh, to everybody is please watch out for your neighbors, especially your elderly neighbors, because we are seeing that they are preying on the elderly. Um, one of the worst, I made a lot of calls this weekend to try and find uh, like-minded people to join our group. And I heard from one lady that she was driving home and she saw her elderly neighbor's truck parked diagonally in his drive, at the end of his driveway. And so she got out and she found out he, there was a woman there talking to him. And this woman was the land agent and she was trying to convince him to sign some papers. But he's very, very hard of hearing and he didn't understand what was going on. And he was so happy to see his neighbor. And she came over and explained to him what was going on. And he said, well, I didn't sign nothing. I didn't sign nothing. And, uh, and, the, and the land agent left, but that's, that's what's going on. So watch out for people. And also these land agents are not local people. Everyone that I've heard about or the people that called us are from out of state. Most of them are coming from the South, Mississippi, Texas, Oklahoma. <laughs> and you mentioned man camp. So this isn't a man camp but they're staying around here in trailers and camps and they're making their calls. So they're out and about and you have to be very, very careful. I just wanted to jump in on that just briefly, Jane. So um, what Bonnie talked about is not uncommon to what we see. I talk about there being a pipeline a playbook of how they do this, identify the elderly, prey on them first, try to con you know, convince anyone they deem as quote unquote weak first. And so another benefit, and we're rolling out this, this structure as we speak, is if you join up with the legal representation and you simply tell them I'm represented by counsel they ethically cannot contact you anymore whatsoever on anything. So there's a huge benefit right there. If you're just like, I've had enough of these harassing phone calls, letters, just tell them to all stop. They funnel through our office and we organize those and then can share information across every one of the latest tricks and tactics. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, if I could say also, uh, my brother who is um, in his nineties, uh, he did let them in the house because he said they're really nice guys and they sat down and they had coffee and they tried to control him into signing but he did not but he said but they were really nice guys so just be very careful just a quick yeah. aside on that on keystone excel trans canada now tc energy uh famously hired a preacher uh side gig uh as a land agent and there's reports uh, I can share it in the email that comes after, but uh, a bland agent uh, offering to kneel down and pray on it with the folks. So there's, there's no shame and whatnot. Anyway, um, back to Jay. There is no bottom for the tactics that they will take. They will start to also offer community grants to nonprofits in your community. They'll offer fire trucks to the local firefighters. They know in a lot of our small rural towns that our first responders, especially the firefighters are all volunteers. And so they usually go to those folks offering equipment, ATVs, fire trucks in order to gain public uh, favor. All of that are tactics that these companies use to try to get essentially a lot of goodwill in the community so then they can run roughshod over the landowners. We know this, it happens in multiple states. 
The good news is, is that a lot of us have been through this and landowners usually are very, very good with their gut and know uh, not to trust people who are trying to take advantage of them. And it's our responsibility to assist. So folks like Jess, Mark and I, we're gonna be here as organizers. There's really strong organizers in every single state, South Dakota, North Dakota, uh, Minnesota, and Kansas. And we're gonna be there to do the organizing assistance with you. Brian and a whole legal team is gonna be there to assist on the legal front, making sure that landowners are not taken advantage of, that we fight eminent domain, that we fight whatever regulatory process these are gonna go through, that we have strong legal representation. So if you're not in Iowa, if you're in Iowa, hopefully you've signed up with Jess. Uh, if you're a landowner in another state, make sure you fill out that form that Mark has in the chat. We'll send it again in the email follow-up. So to summarize, don't sign anything. If these pipeline companies call you, tell them that you want everything in writing. Um, make sure that you continue to tell your neighbors and your friends about us organizing together. And just like with Keystone XL, I am 100% confident that we will not only stop these pipelines, but we will continue to show a path to politicians and elected officials that they have to start prioritizing protecting people's property rights. That is absolutely one of BOLD's main goals, and we're going to continue to work on that as we stop these pipelines. So I want to thank everybody for being here. Thank all the speakers. Thank everyone for uh, taking an hour out of your Thursday, and we will be in touch with more information soon. Thank you, Thanks, Jane. everybody. Thanks, all.